Hi, welcome to the screencast for 12.1 and 12.2. The two big ideas we're going to talk about in here are something called kinetic molecular theory and the intermolecular forces. So kinetic molecular theory speaks mostly to gases, but it applies to uh, particles, whether they're in a solid, liquid, or a gas. It's just that gases, they have the most movement and uh, the most freedom. So kinetic molecular theory and forces of attraction between molecules help us explain the physical behavior of all substances. So combined with the math that we've learned in chapter 10 and 11, um, chapter 10 and 11 help us put numbers to things, but chapter 12 is a huge deal because it helps us get a visual of what's going on because we can't actually see these little particles. So in chapter 12, I'm going to ask you to really concentrate on trying to visualize. I'm going to ask you to diagram a lot what's happening. So these are ideas are a really big deal for understanding what's going on with gases, solutions, reaction rates, equilibrium, and acid bases, which is what we're going to be studying during try 3. So as you know, there's three states of matter. Um, atoms in a molecule can be in a solid, liquid, or gas state. And you may or may not have realized this, but solids and liquids have a lot of variety. If you look around you, lots of different solids and liquids. But gases are pretty similar. In fact, all the gases around you in the air are clear and colorless. Many gases are, have no odor, no taste as we breathe them in and out. So we're going to look at why this tends to be, that gases are so similar and they behave very similar, both physically and chemically, whereas solids and liquids have a lot more variety. So kinetic molecular theory is just what it sounds like. It's movement of molecules. And theory just means it's our idea about how particles move around us. So I'm going to shorten this up and call it KMT. But the idea with kinetic molecular theory is it helps um, explain what's going on around us. So anytime you observe some kind of phenomena, you should be able to explain it using kinetic molecular theory. And that's probably the coolest thing about chemistry is anything you see happening around you in your day-to-day -day life, you could say, you know what, I can figure that out. I can explain that to people. So the three assumptions that it makes about gas particles is that the gas particles are really, really small with huge amounts of empty space between them. And we know that because we can easily walk through gases. We walk through gases all the time. And when we walk through water, we notice. When you try to walk through a solid, you notice. But walking through a gas, no big deal. Why? Because the particles are so tiny and so far apart that gases are mostly empty spaces. And in fact, they're so far apart that there's no attractive or repulsive forces between gas particles. They're too far apart to have an effect on each other's behavior or movement. Number two, gas particles are in constant random motion. Now this is true for solids and liquids also, but just like uh, solids and liquids, the particles are much closer together and the forces do have an effect. Gas particles are so far apart that they have lots of constant random motion. And in fact, they move in a straight line until they collide with each other or collide with some kind of container wall. So gas particles constantly moving, move in a straight line until they hit something, and then they bounce off, just like a, a billiard ball bouncing off another billiard ball or the side of the pool table. And collisions are something we call elastic. And elastic is exactly the opposite of what you've come to know as elastic. Elastic in a collision means no energy is lost, that all the energy that it hits a particle hits a wall with, all that energy either stays with that particle or it gets transferred to another particle. And then the third idea is that mass and velocity affect the kinetic energy of individual gas particles, which makes sense. Heavier particles take more energy to get moving and more energy to stop. Just think about a, a bus and a motorcycle coming out of a stoplight. So it takes more energy to get that bus moving, and then it's also going to take more energy to get it stopped. Um, so mass and velocity are going to affect the total energy of a gas particle and in fact, it's going to be equal to one half of the mass times the volume squared. And this little two here should actually be an uppercase. So let me change that for you. So heavier particles and faster particles will tend to have more energy. That's what that's really telling us. So how does KMT help explain properties of gases? Well, I'm going to go through some common properties of all gases, one of them being low density. How does KMT explain that? Well, density is how tightly packed particles are. Well, of course, gases are going to have extremely do low densities. They have this enormous space between them. So most of a gas is empty space. So gases are going to be lightweight, low densities. Second property, 
Gases are easy to compress and they also expand easily. In fact, they're very sensitive to changes in temperature. So um, how do we know gases can be compressed? Because when you go outside on a cold day with your basketball or your balloon or you go to get your bike out, the gases all move close together and your tire appears flat or your basketball bounces flat or your balloon shrivels up. But when you take it back inside where it's warm, voila, it reinflates itself. All of a sudden, your tire's filled back up. Your ball has got the bounce back. So what's going on there? It's simply the gas particles moving closer together as the energy is removed and they slow down or the particles spreading apart when they have more energy. So gas particles are going to expand to take up any space available, but they can also be compressed or forced into a smaller space. And that's all because of this huge amount of space between them that we can increase or decrease. Shape and volume. Gases have no definite shape and no definite volume. If you want a gas to have a shape, you have to put it in a container. If you want to have a volume, you have to close that container off. So you can blow a, a balloon up with gas, with air. It'll take on the shape. You can easily change that shape. That's what makes balloon animals so fun is you can change that shape around. And you have to tie that balloon off if you want to keep the volume constant. And again, this is because they have constant motion and there's no attractive force holding them in place like there is with liquids and gases. And then number four, diffusion and effusion, they're virtually the same thing. Diffusion you're familiar with. Diffusion is one gas moving through another. So if somebody sprays body spray, pretty soon everybody in the room smells it. And uh, that's diffusion. It's one gas moving through another. Why does it happen? Because gases are constantly moving. So even though you spray the gas or the body spray at the front of the room, eventually those particles are going to find their way all the way to the back. They're going to get themselves evenly spread out through the room. Effusion is just slightly different. It's when a gas escapes from a container, like a tire with a leak. Or I can give you an example at school. When the fax room is cooking just down the hall, it doesn't take long for us to be able to smell whatever they're cooking in room 117. That's a fusion because the gas in there has to find the doorway, come out into the hallway, and then find our doorway. So it's not going to be quite as, a, a, as quickly as diffusion, but it'll still happen. Those gases are going to find the opening, the doorway, in both uh, the fax room and in our classroom. So both of these properties occur because of the random motion and because of the lack of attractive forces. The last thing to talk about from section 12.1 is this idea of pressure. And pressure is a really overused and misused word. Using the word pressure, and I'm just going to warn you, when you're explaining anything to me in chapter 12 and in chemistry in general, if you use the word pressure, it better come with an explanation because using the word pressure doesn't tell me anything unless you tell me what's going on with the particles involved in creating that pressure. For example, if someone steps on your foot wearing a tennis shoe, it hurts. But if that same person steps on your foot with just the heel of the stiletto he's wearing, that hurts a whole lot more. How come? It's a change in pressure. Now, does that really tell you what's happened? No. What I mean is the person's weight is exactly the same. That person would get a whole lot heavier just because he put on stilettos. It's because now instead of their weight being spread over a larger area, it's all being concentrated into one small painful spot on your foot. This is exactly why you use a hammer is to concentrate all your force into one place, you know, the nail you're trying to pound in. And unfortunately, that means when you hit your thumb with the nail or with the hammer, it's going to hurt a lot because you've concentrated all that pressure or all that force into one spot. So gas pressure. Again, pressure is the force exerted compared to the area. So lying down on ice spreads out your weight, decreases the pressure. And same thing happens with gases. If we force gases into one area, they're going to exert more pressure. If we let gases spread out, they'll exert less pressure. Gases exert pressure when they collide with something. If they don't collide, there's no pressure. But when they collide, they exert a pressure. The faster it's moving, the more pressure exerts. The more often they collide, the greater the pressure is. We have air pressure or atmospheric pressure around us all the time. And it's exerted in all directions since air is all around us. So air pressure doesn't just act down. Gravity, you know, tends to help that out, but air pressure acts in all ways. That's how we can get planes up in the air. This is how balloons are able to fly. Typically, we don't notice air pressure on us because it's constant 
and our bodies are built to live under this constant pressure. But we notice when it changes quickly, like when you're in a really uh, tall elevator and you're changing a lot of floors or when you're in a plane, especially when you're um, landing or taking off, then we notice it. But typically we don't 